It's a real pleasure to be here to share some of the sort of the insights and some of the stories that I found when I was working on, on Taleb um, But first, what I want to do is I want to take you away from my booth. I want to take you away from 2015. I want to take you to the Palace of Versailles. I want to take you to pre-revolutionary France. Now this is the days of Louis XVI, days of opulence, days of military adventures, days of economic and political malaise in France. That culminated in the French Revolution and the death of a king from the guillotine. The thing is, when you look at Versailles, when you look at what's happening there, it's very similar to what's happening now. There was no press at the time to speak of. Now, people weren't supposed to talk about what was happening in court, what the king was up to, who he was sleeping with that particular week or day. But there was an emerging bourgeoisie, merchants, tradesmen, who wanted to know what was going on. And back then, the news spread like the news spreads today. And it spread at places like this. So this was the tree of Krakow in one of the parks in Paris. And what would happen here is people would get together and share what they knew. If they'd heard a rumor, if they had some speculation, if they had a bit of news about what was happening in the campaign against the English, if they heard about what the king was wasting France's money on, here is they would come and share their knowledge. Be it fact or fiction and compare notes. And maybe some of it made it into songs, some of it made it into letters. But basically this was the Twitter of its day. Of course, something like this is bound by physical limits, by geography. And the difference today, of course, between the tree of cracker and Twitter is social media, is the volume, the velocity, the visibility, and the reach of information that goes beyond the people we're seeing in the park and actually reach way beyond our borders. Now, when I look at social media, I say, well, what's changed isn't the fact that we're sharing and telling everyone about what we're up to. That's constant. Our urge to share is a constant because we're social actors, we're human beings, and that's what we do. We did it in the Tree of Krakow, we did it in cafes, we do it now through social media. But it's really the environment in which we're doing this the fact that tools, the technologies, the platforms, that has changed. That means we have to think differently about what we do and how we share. And for me, a real vivid illustration of this was um, during the Arab Spring, particularly with the uprising in Egypt. Probably because I was, I was based in the Middle East for the BBC in the early 90s. I have, as a journalist, I had the honor of having been expelled from Tunisia, which for journalists is like a badge of honor. You have your bucket list. Expulsion from a dictatorship. <laughs> right? That's on my CV, good. I'll get me a promotion. Um, so I was in, in Egypt then, and it was one where Mubarak was in charge, demonstrations weren't allowed. If there were any demonstrations, they were put down, nobody reported on them. And yet, in January 2011, I'm sitting in Vancouver, and I'm watching what's happening in Tahrir, broadcast on live 25 news channels, but then also being tweeted being Facebooked, being shared, not just by journalists there reporting what's going on, but with the people at the very center of this. The people there telling their own stories. And that to me is the big shift. The fact that activists, everybody has the tool to tell their own story, but that's not enough. The fact that everybody can be heard isn't enough. It's about listening, it's about attention, and who gets the attention on social media. And this is one of the people who got the attention during the Egyptian uprising. Gigi Ibrahim goes on um, Twitter by the handle gsquare86, graduate of the American University of Cairo. On Facebook, she describes herself as a revolutionary professional. And during this time in Egypt's history, she was one of these voices that emerged from the square, first by providing blow-by-blow -blow accounts of 
where the police were, what trains, what undergrounds were running, what buses were being blocked, and then picked up by activists, and eventually by the Western media. Now, she became very much one of these faces of the revolution. She's Western educated, comes from an elite family, articulate, journalists would often describe her as attractive, and she was this bridge that emerged on social media between what was happening in Cairo and the West. You know, she was, for journalists, she was a gift, especially for TV networks. Put her on TV, she can tell you, this is the wishes of the Egyptian people, and she speaks perfect English. Perfect for the West. In fact, Time magazine uh, included her in what they called the generation changing the world. But there's a problem with Gigi and with the way the West elevated these voices and paid attention to them. The problem is, we saw a distorted picture. We didn't actually see what was really happening in Egypt. And that picture was then reflected by the mainstream media. So certainly, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing this picture of a technologically savvy youth armed with smartphones who, with a Facebook page, can overturn a military regime. It's a very seductive idea. We loved to hear that message on social. We loved to hear reflected in the mainstream media. Because these are people like us. We want people in Egypt to be like us, to be us so we can connect with them, and connect with them by hearing their stories on social media. Of course, what we didn't see was the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic parties, the Islamists who'd be essentially running a parallel state under Mubarak for 30 years, building up a network of support through the mosques, building a social safety net through the mosques. They weren't on Twitter, they weren't on Facebook. We didn't see them. They didn't speak English. So the picture we got was a very distorted one. So hardly surprising, come the elections, Islamist parties win a majority. And this is one of the pitfalls of social media, that what we see isn't necessarily the whole picture, but one perspective. But we see what we want to see. And that's both sort of the beauty and the ugliness of social media. In that for something like this to catch on, for us to be receptive to the message of somebody like Gigi Ibrahim, it has to be a message that we want to hear. For something to catch on on social, it has to find a willing audience that wants to sit there listen to it, and then amplify that message. Now what that means is when we think in terms of what does go viral, what takes off socially, we think, well, why do some things catch on? Because there's an audience ready to repeat and share that message. There's an audience primed for that kind of narrative. And you see this over and over again with what happens on social media. So this is something else I talk about in the book, you remember? Obama, Romney debates, the second presidential debate. Romney mentions his comments, binders full of women. So Romney is in an endless debate. Romney has this rather inelegant phrasing. Talks binders full of women. What happens within minutes becomes a running joke on Twitter. That's some hashtags. Lots of people take pictures of themselves with binders. It becomes a running joke. Because it's very easy. Funny thing to say in that context. But the actual meaning of the phrase, essentially what Romney was saying is, I have lots of smart women that I can call on for top jobs in my administration. Isn't that what we want to hear? Male politicians say, yeah, I recognize there's lots of smart women and I want them to help me run the country. But that wasn't what we heard. We heard binders full of women. It became this joke. That moment became the story. And part of the reason for that is because we were primed to hear a gaffe. You know, we don't watch things like this for political insights. We watch it to see who's going to score points, who's going to make a mistake, who's going to say something stupid. So then, then we can jump on it and make fun of it. And that's what happened here. We were primed for that gaffe. And then suddenly the story becomes the bind is full of women. Not Romney has women he can call on doesn't become the substance of the debate. The moment becomes the story. And this is what happens in social media, that we as a collective 
apart from deciding how this event will get reported. We decided that this debate should be reported as Romney's gaffe. And that became the story. It wasn't just journalists telling us, this is what you should think about the debate. We decided it, journalists followed and amplified it, and then it became the big overwhelming theme here. And again, you see the same thing happening, how the moment becomes the story, because we make it the story. So I'll take you back to Sochi, the Winter Olympics, last year. So some of you may be following this through social media, and in the run-up there were lots of stories about things that weren't ready. And as we know in Vancouver, when you have a big event, there tend to be teething troubles. Maybe there's not enough snow on the mountain. Maybe things aren't quite ready. That's common with big events. But what you saw through the stories highlighted on social media, they gave us a certain view of what was happening. They didn't tell us a story of amazing athletes. They told us a story of things that were going wrong in Russia. These kind of weird, embarrassing, only in Russia could this kind of happen. And journalists and athletes and all sorts of people there. So you may have seen this treatment from the American boxer to Johnny Queen. Death trapped in a bathroom, post how he basically breaks his way out of the bathroom through the door. And a few days later, it happened to him again. So we're still hearing athletes and not saying these are amazing accommodations, they're complaining about being stuck in bathrooms. And for some reason, on social media, there was a lot of talk about washrooms and bathrooms. It was really interesting to see. It was like this common thing, never mind Olympic sports. Let's talk about the bathrooms in Russia. Let's talk about the bathrooms in Sochi. The fact that you can actually watch yourself in action through the mirrors on the ceiling as you do your private thing. And of course, you know, we just couldn't get enough of these bathrooms. We had, well, let's share the bathroom. Let's be social about our bathroom experiences, both through social media and in practice. But this is, these are some examples of how you see that who decides what makes the news but also how we think of the news. It used to be something that journalists would tell you, CBC would tell you, the Global Mail would tell you, but we're instead setting the agenda. And in some ways deciding we're going to pick on certain aspects of the story, such as weird bathroom arrangements, and say, this is what we should be thinking about Sochi, Sochi problems, only in Russia, weirdness, embarrassing stuff, not anything of substance. And that's really the sort of the big shift, this idea that you know, if news was an hourglass with media in between, now those filters are still there, journalists and media still exist, but we are the filters as well. We are also collectively making decisions about what's important, what we should pay attention to, who we should listen to, but also what we should think about a particular event, issue, etc. Now it's all these players that are in the news games. The journalists, celebrities, prominent figures, you and me, algorithms, platforms, all these different things are now basically <coughs> part of this bottleneck. And often when you think of social media, it can seem overwhelming, the, the nature of the change of what's happening. So how do you make sense of this? Part of this is when you get new forms of communication, there's always a sense of anxiety. So Socrates, he didn't really like books. He thought that if people started reading books, they would stop thinking. In the Middle Ages, when they introduced written records, people didn't like written records because they said, how can I trust this piece of paper? It might be a forgery. I should go to the, that, the old guy, the one who lives in the barn over the hill. He's lived here for the last 30 years. His memory is going to be more reliable than this piece of paper because this could be a forgery. People actually thought that. There's this fear of technology, fear of media. In the 17th century, an English scholar called Robert Burton, he wrote a book, um, and in part of it, he complains about the fact that he's getting new news every day, that he's hearing of new you know, rumors of war, plagues, fires, inundations, thefts, murders, massacres, meteors, comets, spectrums, prodigies, apparitions, towns taken, Sits besieged and more every day. How could he possibly cope if he heard something new every day? It was just impossible. 
So we, you know, these, these sort of things are there. Like, one of the things I do in the book is sort of try to place what we're living through in this kind of historical context. That we always have these biases. And it's fine. It's, we do it because that's who we are. We like to live in the cozy embrace of the familiar. We like to live in the media that we grew up with, and the things that make sense when we were there. I was at, at UBC this morning, and um, the young daughter of my colleagues was there, and she was asking us to define social media. And it was really hard because for her, social media wasn't this thing, other thing. For her, it just was media. Like everything was social media to her. We were trying to explain how, yeah, but yeah, there's these other things but not social media, like things on paper and television and stuff. And she couldn't understand it because in her world it was all media. And that's because she grew up with it. And we are always sort of shaped by the media we grew up with. We're creatures of habit. Um, Marshall McLuhan talks about it as, you know, we look at the present through this rear view mirror. So as a result, we march backwards into the future. Read my book and tell everyone that's really an appeal for us to look ahead, not behind us. To look and march into that future, eyes set ahead, not look through the mirror, not filter it through what made sense to us, but to take those steps into that future. But for that, we need to understand the space we're operating. We need to have the right skills. We need to have the right expertise so we can make informed and best decisions. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to the panel. Any questions? Thank you.